morning to you. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I want to thank your pastors for this kind invitation to be here with you this morning to worship God together with you and also to bring God's Word. Reverend Joshua said that uh, this is the final installation. And I realized that this is the last service, Sunday service here okay? in this uh, sanctuary. Next week you'll be on the other side. I think this side. And you'll be on the other side, this side. <laughs> next week. Uh, so it's my honor and privilege to be uh, on this service especially uh, because I'm sure for many of you it brings a lot of memories and, uh, of, of uh, God's presence in your life, God's work in your life. Let us go to God in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity you have given us to gather together as your people in your name, to worship you, to gather around your word, to listen to your word, so that your Holy Spirit will bring the truth of your word freshly into our lives, that we may be given grace to hear, to believe, to understand, and to be transformed. Lord, speak to us now, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We have been looking at the doctrine of the Trinity the last two days, uh, but actually more yesterday. And uh, today I want to carry on that thought and apply it to one very important aspect of our lives, which is our prayer life. How does the doctrine of the Trinity actually help us in our prayer life? That's the question I like to ask as we come to this particular text. I want to begin with the story of Tolika, who was Bishop of Smyrna in present-day Turkey, which is called Ismir at the moment. And he was a bishop in the second century, Tolika. He knew John, the Apostle John, uh, and therefore was personally discipled by this beloved disciple of Jesus Christ. And, he's, and he lived a long life as a faithful man of God. But at the end of his life, he had a problem because he refused to bow down to an image of the emperor, the Roman emperor, and to offer incense as a kind of worship to the emperor. He refused to call the emperor Kurios which means Lord, because he said, there is only one Lord in my life, and that Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ. I will not call any other man Lord. There will be no other Lords before my Lord. So he refused to bow down to the image of the emperor. And for that, he was brought to trial and sentenced to death. And the judge who was uh, looking at him, he actually respected uh, Polycarp and he tried his best to persuade Polycarp, you know, it's just one word, just, just mention it, you'll be okay, you'll save yourself. And Polycarp gave a wonderful answer. He said, eight years, six years, have I served him and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? So he refused to do it. He says, it's better to die faithful than to live on unfaithful. And so he was at the stake and the fire was lit up. And as it was done, he prayed this prayer. It's a beautiful prayer. He said, I bless thee, Lord God, Almighty Father, through the eternal and heavenly high priest, Jesus Christ, thy beloved Son, through whom be to thee with him and the Holy Spirit, glory, now and for all ages to come. Amen. That's how he prayed just before he died. And the beauty of that prayer is the Trinitarian nature of that prayer. A man who is dying as a martyr for Christ, in his lips comes a prayer that is Trinitarian, praying to the Father, and mentioning the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And I think this is what motivates us 
and grounds us in our prayer life. That poses a question. When you pray, who do you pray to? If you believe in the Trinity, by God, who do you pray to? And that's an interesting question. I've often asked congregations, who do you mentally know in your mind? Who do you pray to? Can I take a straw poll here? So don't be shy. Don't, I, won't, I won't tell you you're wrong. Okay, you're very safe. Don't worry. <laughs> How many of you pray to the Father? Father God. Mainly, no? I'm saying that mainly that's your habit. Pray to Father God. Okay. How many of you pray to the Lord Jesus Christ? Mainly. Okay, some. How many of you pray to the Holy Spirit? Okay, some. Okay. Now, it gets a bit confusing, isn't it? Because I've heard prayers and say, Father God, like that, like that, and then you were crucified on the cross for us. Somehow we have changed the train, you know, they changed the track. And we still, anyone listening uh, who's not a Christian or who's a new Christian will get very confused. Now, who was crucified on the cross? Is it the Father or is it the Holy Spirit? I mean, is it Jesus Christ? And so it can get very confusing. And in the tradition of the church, the general teaching and understanding has been using the example of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Lord's prayer that we taught, we pray to Father God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because we dare not approach Father God without the Lord Jesus Christ. It is in His name that we have access to the Father. So we pray in His name and we pray in the power of the Holy Spirit with the strength and the assistance of the Holy Spirit. So that's usually the standard way of praying to avoid confusion when we pray. I've often heard prayers that become very confusing. We don't know who we are. Suddenly we are talking to the Father, then suddenly we are talking to Jesus, then we are the Holy Spirit. And uh, as long as you are clear, it's okay. In the prayer you say, Father God, you know, you are so good to me, you provide for me. And Lord Jesus Christ, you died for me on the cross. I thank you. And Holy Spirit, you spend me every day. Okay, you are quite clear what you are talking about. But what's confusing is, you know, uh, that uh, you pray to Jesus and you say, uh, you are my heavenly Father, Lord Jesus. Oh, that's a, a bit confusing, right? Okay, so that's how we pray. But I think more important than getting it right, generally speaking, is uh, how we understand the Trinity in relation to our prayer. Now, by the way, before I conclude this, uh, can we pray to the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, yes, we can. Because scriptures teach us that too. The Lord Himself in John 14 verse 14, He says, You may ask me, you may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Now, if we follow Jesus as to what he actually said, we can actually speak to Jesus directly and in his name. And he says he will answer our prayer. So there is scriptural warrant for praying to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's okay. Sometimes we want to pray to him directly. And can we pray to the Holy Spirit? There is no biblical indication anywhere in the Bible that anyone prays specifically to the Holy Spirit. But my own take on it is, if I were to know each person of the Trinity, how can I develop a relationship unless there is a conversation going on? So, I mean, you come to church, do you know everybody who's here in the church? No. You know some people because you talk to them. Every Sunday you talk to them. Even before service you talk to them. And then you're talking even as the opening song is sung. <laughs> because you, you enjoy talking to that person, right? And of course, if you converse, you get to know the person. And you can say, I know this person. 
But supposing there is a church member who you see but you never talk, can you say that you have a relationship with that person? It's very difficult. So my understanding of the three persons in the Trinity, whom we are supposed to know and love as separate persons within the Trinity, I need to have an ongoing conversation with each of them, with the Father, with the Son, and with the Holy Spirit. So I think that uh, from a theological point of view, uh, from a devotional point of view, yes, it is okay to pray for the Holy Spirit. Sometimes I do pray like that too. When I stand at the pulpit, just before stepping up, I say, Lord Holy Spirit, anoint me. Give me your function so that when I am hiding behind the cross, so that when I, pray, when I preach, I preach with your power and to preach the word of God to God's people. So yes, I think that uh, we need to understand this, but most importantly, in this passage that was read, there are two outstanding promises that give us an indication of how the doctrine of the Trinity is to inspire us to pray and to assist in prayer as we faithfully pray to the triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And the first promise is this. It is a very famous promise in verse 28. We read this. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those God for you, He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of His Son. And then in verse 31, Paul writes, What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? So the first promise is that God is for us. You know, that should lift your depressed spirit whenever we pray. God is for me. And not just God as a concept, as an idea, as a doctrine, as a but God, as we understand in the Bible, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God is trying, God is for me. He is working together, all things together, for the good of those who love Him. So if I love Him, I am called according to His purpose. I know that God is working together all these things, all the things in my life, my health, my relationship, my finances, my psychological well-being, my position in society, my family life. In all of these things, God is working together for the good of me because He is for me. And if God is for me, why should I be worried about those who are against me? And that actually helps us and inspires us to pray to God. You know, God is for me. He's the highest authority in the universe. And before I run around and make friendly calls for help from this lawyer or that doctor or that politician or that powerful wealthy man, before all of this, I go to the one who I know is clearly for me. And I pray to him, the triumph God. Because I know he's working together everything for the good of my life. Now it's interesting that in the portrayal here, God the Father, and then we also have the Holy Spirit interceding for us. And we also have this picture of Jesus Christ interceding for us. So can you imagine that the Trinity is actually working for you? The Spirit and the Son are praying for you. And the Father listens to those prayers. And together, Father, Son and Holy Spirit are working together for your good. You know, you... I don't, I don't know how to express this, but you, you should be so encouraged. When in the morning we pray, you're going for an interview, or you're going to the doctor's clinic to find out the results of the biopsy, or whatever you are facing. 
And then you say a prayer and you realize the highest authorities in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are for me. And when you realize that, you have peace in your heart. You have, you have this growing trust in God. No matter what happens, you know God is for me. And He will have the final say in my life. No matter what others say, God will have the final say. Because He's the judge of everything. And He will have the last word in my life. And if He has the last word, why should I be worried? Why should I be worried? I like the way Helmut Filippi once spoke to his congregation after the second, well, at the end of the Second World War. Helmut Filippi was a German pastor, was faithful to Christ, refused to bow down to the Nazis and all of them. And uh, he paid the price for it. And when the Allied forces had bombed the cities of Germany, his own city, Stuttgart, was bombed terribly. And the church was bombed and it was in ruins. And yet on a Sunday morning, people came to church because that's the only solace they had in that kind of situation. And Helmut Filippi was praying to God, Lord, what message do you have for your people? What can I say to them in this hour? And so as he went to church to preach the sermon, and within the ruins, people found their spots to sit there and there. He asked this question. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, do you believe that the final hour is yours? The final hour is yours. Because the final hour belongs to Jesus. And if you belong to Jesus, the final hour is yours. And so everybody started nodding slowly, yes, yes, the final hour is ours. And then he threw in his main point, he said, if the final hour is yours, then why be anxious of the next minute? If the final hour is yours, then why be anxious of the next minute? If you can see by faith, the promises of God that in the end all will be well and that Christ will restore everything because this trying God is at work in my life and He will set everything right. No more tears, no more pain, no more death, no more mourning, no more grieving. He will have the last word in my life. And if He has the authority to have the last word in my life, my dear brothers and sisters, why should we panic? Why should we tremble with fear? Because we are people of faith. We belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, whose final hour is ours. And we know that every day of our lives, every moment of our life, this trying God is at work. It's not just one person, three persons are at work, working together everything for the good of those who love God. You know, this is very, very inspiring and encouraging for me personally. Because every time I pray and I realize Father, Son and Holy Spirit together, they have assented to my final end, my destiny. And if they say yes, who can say no? If the Father, Son and Holy Spirit together are for me, who can actually be? against me. Who will succeed in whatever they do against me? No force, nothing can, can succeed in doing anything against me. That so that should make all of us smile. Afterwards, when you go out from the sanctuary, please go with a smile. Not a false smile. Not because the service is over. <laughs> but because you have a glow in your face as you realize that the final hour is yours. Because God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit loves you. And is for you. For you. No matter what circumstances you are facing. And I think this Trinitarian truth actually warms our hearts and gives us spring in our steps and gives us faith to live by and a hope that we can live with. And that is what this 
is all about. Now, I want to uh, move on uh, to another important point here in this passage. Not only is God for us, God is also with us. Now, there's no verse in this passage that says God is with us. In the same way that we read in verse 31, God is for us. But why do I say that the second major promise is God is with us? Because this is how this passage ends. In all these things, verse 37, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is for me. And then the promise, nothing in, the, in this earth or this universe has the power to separate me from God's love. Which means God is with me also. God is not only for me, God is not a distant power who just, you know, arranges things for me and makes sure that I'm okay. But this God who is for me is also with me. That is why the name of Jesus is interesting. You know, Jesus had a couple of names given to him when he was born. The first of course, of course, is Jesus. What does Jesus mean? Don't be shy. Just mention, what does Jesus mean? Hmm? Jesus, Joshua, Yeshua. What does it mean? <coughs> Savior. Yeah, he saves. The one who saves me. So I would say Jesus actually means God is for me. That is why he sent the Savior. God is for me. He died on the cross for me. And he saves me. God is for me. And then Jesus was given another name. What's that name? Emmanuel. And what does that mean? God is with us. Right? Two truths that are contained in this person of Christ. And he was born. You shall call him Jesus and you shall call him Emmanuel. God is for me. God is with me. These two truths are repeated in this particular passage in terms of our prayer and the connection of our prayer with the Trinity. When we pray to the triune God, we recognize more and more deeply that God is for me. This triune God is for me. And then also I, I learn and discover more deeply that this God is actually with me. This God is with me in my struggles, in my situation in life. Now what is a mystery here is this. I ask you a question. Can God pray to God? You can tell this to anyone outside the church. God praying to God. Is that self-talk? Is that self-talk? When you read John chapter 17, when Jesus prays to the Father for His disciples and for the church that is, that is coming in the future, is, is that just God talking to Himself? Self-talk? It cannot be. That is why we need the doctrine of the Trinity. You could just believe in one God, monotheistic and no separation, no divisions whatsoever, then it becomes nothing but self-talk, God talking to Himself. But no, this is God talking to God. And to me, every time I read John 17, I am amazed that God has lifted the curtain aside a little bit and allowed me to look into His mystery. And His mystery is that God actually talks to God. And His mind-boggling mystery. And here in Romans 8, Paul reveals a further dimension of this mystery when he says the Son, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is at the right hand of the Father and is interceding for us. Verse 34. 
He is interceding for you. He is praying for you. Now that's quite amazing. Not only is Jesus praying for me, we are also told that the Holy Spirit is also interceding for us in verse 26. And also verse 27, the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Now, this is amazing stuff, really. Because it tells me that there is an internal conversation going on within the Trinity. And guess what's the subject matter of that internal conversation? Us. Do you know that Jesus is praying for Trinity Methodist Church, PJ? Do you know that the Holy Spirit is praying for Trinity Methodist Church, PJ? Right now? Do you know that Jesus is praying for you right now? And that the Holy Spirit is also praying for you right now? You know, sometimes in church, when we say, I've got a big day, back day, summer day, or whatever, food day, and uh, the, the Christian friend will say, I'll pray for you, but never pray. <laughs> it's just a matter of courtesy, right? Uh, I'll pray for you, I'll pray for you. Next week, you'll meet that person, did you pray for me? Oh, no, 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 I forgot. <laughs> and you know, even if everybody forgets to pray for you this morning, do you know that the Son of God and the Spirit of God never fail to pray for you? You have intercessors in heaven who are praying for you all the time, moment by moment. You know, that again should encourage you. That within the Trinity there is a prayer going on, there is intercession going on for me, for us, for my family, for my spiritual growth for the temptations that I face, for the struggles that I have in life. The Spirit of God and the Son of God are interceding for me. This is amazing stuff that we can actually understand that the Trinity is not only for us, but also with us. Now the, the way the Spirit intercedes for us is quite fascinating. Because here Paul says, the Spirit intercedes for us with groans. Have you heard anyone pray with groans? I don't know how to uh, show that. You know what it means. You know when you kick your leg and step on a nail, what do you do? You groan with pain. Oh! And that's exactly what it is. In Romans 8, actually there's a chorus, there's a choir of groaning. Because Paul, if you read carefully, creation is groaning. All the earthquakes and the pollution, the damage that is being done to creation. Creation is groaning. And then Paul says, we are also groaning. So there's a choir here, first creation, groaning. Then human beings groaning and the amazing thing is that God joins the choir. And here we have this proof that the Spirit of God is also groaning in prayer for us. It tells me that God is not just one distant power there, like those in power and authority you write to them, they may not fully understand your position. They just say, I'll try my best forever. But this God is not only there, but He's also here with us. He's into our pain, into our situation, into our struggles, into our anxieties. He's here with us, and He's also groaning with us. I don't know how to express this, but sometimes when you really feel you are alone, nobody understands you. Nobody understands what it's like to be told that you will only live for two more weeks. Nobody understands what it means to be condemned for something that you never did, or wrong that you never did. Nobody will understand losing everything you have. 
because somebody cheated you. And in that kind of situation, you know, when you groan inwardly, you suddenly find somebody else groaning with you. And that's the Holy Spirit. And in that moment you realize God is with me. God is with me and He understands perfectly what I'm going through. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. The Apostle Paul, in his, in his uh, final days as he stood on trial, he wrote this, these words. He says, The Lord stood with me. Everybody ran away and abandoned me, but the Lord stood with me. And that's the truth uh, that we find here. Now, what about um, the Lord Jesus? How does He intercede for us? How does He pray for us? And uh, I, I think of Dietrich von Hofer, who said that the, the book of Psalms is not only the song book of Israel, but it's actually the prayer book of Jesus. Now, that's an interesting thought. He's saying that every human emotion and every human cry to God for, for forgiveness or for help or for salvation or for protection, every human prayer raised to God is expressed in some and it's been prayed by the Lord Jesus Christ, the representative man. Now that's an interesting thought. So one way to understand how Jesus is interceding for us is to turn to the book of Psalms. And on the cross, remember, he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that comes from the sun. So that's an example of how Jesus uh, ventilates for us the prayers of our heart. But I'd like to go a bit further than that. If you want to know what Jesus is praying for you, not only read the Psalms, but also read John 17. I don't have time to go into that, but I think a study, a reflective study, a meditative study of John 17 will tell us what the Lord Jesus is still praying for us as individuals, as families, as a church, as a body of Christ. And then I'm going to say something that I hope you won't misunderstand. Me. I believe that you can actually Ask God to help you to listen to Jesus praying for you. I know this may sound very esoteric and mystical, but I'm just asking you, if Jesus is praying for you right now, let's say you try it tomorrow morning. Jesus is praying for you right now. Do you think that you could overhear God talking to God about you? You know, sometimes uh, a, a, a son or a daughter is very curious. The parents are, you know, in their room and whispering. And then over here, they right, realize, hey, they're talking about me. Right? The father says, he's a hopeless fellow. <laughs> Mommy says, oh, give him another chance. He's actually a nice boy. And so you, you hear, okay, they're talking about me. You're curious. And so if God is talking to God, if the Son is talking to the Father, the Spirit is talking to the Father, is it possible that we could discern in some way what we are talking about us? What is Jesus praying for you this morning? And I want to suggest that if you really, by the grace of God, you are given a chance to overhear the conversation between father and son. What would Jesus be praying for you right now? Would he be praying, saying something about the spiritual condition of your life? He says, Father, he's so busy, so distracted, he's prayed away for years now. I pray that you will touch his heart and turn him back yourself? Or would he reveal what lies in your heart, your fears, your anxieties? Father, he gets upset so easily, but actually he's very afraid of life. Very afraid of what's going to happen to him. 
when he retires and so on and so forth or maybe Jesus is talking about your hopes and aspirations or he's talking about your duplicities and weaknesses that you are you 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 are not you know you are split between your split personality so to speak or your sinful tendencies Jesus is concerned about your sinful habits that if you don't put a stop to it it will destroy your soul so Jesus is praying for to the Father for that he said he's getting more and more addicted to pornography or something like that Father save him break help help him to break free from this bondage in his life and what would Jesus say about his will for you father i want him to serve me in this way i want to i want him to serve in that way so they are talking about your service and what you ought to be doing so you see if you listen to the lord jesus christ then you will also know how to pray for yourself right here you are praying god should it be toyota or mazda i don't know which one to choose and here and over here jesus is without a single word about toyota or mazda and jesus is praying that you will be a good steward of what god has provided for you you realize their concern the trinitarian concern are so different from our materialistic commercialized concerns in this world and we are wasting so much time on commercial decisions and commercial choices if only we care to listen to what god is saying to god about our lives it will be a revolutionary change in our lives and what about the holy spirit the holy spirit is also interceding for us and whatever he says will be the same as whatever jesus says so you have a stereo effect when you listen to god speaking to god you find that there's a conversation that's going on that has divine consensus that is divine in the energy and it encourages you as you realize you are right in the center of god's will this is what god wants from your life and this is what god is saying to your life and that i believe is important i remember reading recently about a sri lankan brother who uh, died recently and he worked for you for christ sri williams is his name and uh, uh, there was a time when uh, he was in uh, jaffna in the north and it was terrible time because the, the army sri lankan army was attacking the tiger the rebel tigers and so people were caught between the two forces so to speak and it was it was a very dangerous situation for anyone a christian especially to be there with his family so many of suri's friends asked him you better come back to longo which is safer but suri said no and even dr ajit fernando his boss said suri you better come back we are very concerned for the safety and apparently this is what suri did when the when the fighting ceased for a while he went out of his house it's a very dirty street he cleaned up the street and then he called some of his friends to help clean up and the indian peace keeping forces saw this and they said okay the commander said you soldiers better come and do what we are doing what an inspiration and when the shells are flying across here and there here he is in the garden having a prayer meeting and they're singing hymns and songs amazing so when his boss asked him to come back he wrote to his boss and he said i know from my experience and i believe that the safest place to be in is in god's will to be in god's will is the safest thing that can happen to us and he says i know this is god's will and this is the safest place i can be in and that comes from actually listening to god praying to god about you and to be convinced that this is god's will for you and if this is god's will for you 
Nothing can shake you. No fear. Because you know that's the safest place. So how many of us have that kind of certainty to know this is God's will for me because I know uh, that the Son and the Spirit are saying the same thing to the Father. There's an internal conversation going on and I'm so certain in my heart that this is where God wants me to be. You know, there's no, no peace deeper than that. There's no joy deeper than that. To be right in the center of God's will. So I want to ask you, as I bring this to a close, how is your prayer life? How is your prayer life? If the Son of God and the Spirit of God actually pray for you every day, then I think we ought to reciprocate and join that prayer. Actually, the prayer is not my own prayer. When I pray for myself or my family or my friends, I, I say, no, it's, it's not my prayer that is powerful. When I pray, I try my best to join the prayer that is already been made to the Father by the Son and the Holy Spirit. And by praying, I, I'm simply participating in what is going on. It is a Trinitarian event that is taking place, a conversation. So when I pray, I simply participate in that prayer. Now, you know, when you pray for your friends or family or other colleagues, how do you know what to pray for them? This is particularly a, a problem for pastors, I must tell you. Especially visiting very sick people in hospital. When I started off as a pastor, I remember in my early days, I went to see uh, a person who was really dead, uh, not dead, a woman <laughs> who was almost dead. <laughs> almost dead. It was sudden, sudden, uh, in a stroke, a massive stroke. So I went to pray. And the wife is, was a new, uh, just coming to church. The mother, the mother was also coming to church. And I thought, you know, what do I, how do I pray for this person? He's not a Christian. And he was beating up his wife. So how do I pray for him? It was a struggle. So Lord, be with him or help him in his hour of need. It's, it's a bit risky, right, in, in this kind of situation to say, Lord, raise him up. Next day he does. <laughs> then they, they call him false prophet, right? A pastor who doesn't know how to pray for the sick. Or worse, you, you feel that it's going to go all deep in grace to make the transition to the other shore. And then he gets out of bed. One week later, he's discharged. And the family hates you for what you're sending off so quickly. Then God actually had other plans for him. There was a pastor I heard who became infamous for sending people off. Because every time he visited very sick people in hospital, he prays for them at night. By next morning, they are gone. <laughs> so he became infamous for that. So much so that if anybody in the church got sick, very sick, they would call their friends and say, My auntie is very sick. But please don't tell Pastor. <laughs> because he became quite infamous. <laughs> and you know, when I heard about it, I said, Lord, teach me how to pray. Because I don't know how to pray in a situation like that. Teach me how to pray. And I realized that in the life of Jesus, everything he prayed for came out true. And what's the secret? Because he knew his Father. Because he knew his Father, he knew his Father's will. So I became mathematical in my understanding. We, we prayed in science. I said, Lord, I realized that in you know, my prayer for others' intercession, only about 25% come through. Can you help me to know you more, to discern your will more, so that like Jesus, the percentage of 
accuracy of my intercessory prayers increases so that I long one day at least I long 60 to 70 percent of my intercessory prayers are answered. Help me to know. It's not a technique, by the way, not like, you know, slide about three, but help me to become more and more accurate. You know, it's, it's really a deep heartfelt prayer. Lord, help me to know you more deeply. So that it will show up in, my, in the way I pray for others. And then I come to this passage, I realize a deeper secret or mystery. When I pray for others, it helps to listen to Jesus not only praying for me, interceding for me, but he's also interceding for my wife and my children and my friends and my church members. So if I listen carefully, I begin to learn how to pray for others. Because that's what Jesus is praying, that's what the Spirit is praying. And if I only quieten my heart to listen to the Son and the Spirit praying to the Father about others, not just me, but about others, I soon find myself joining in their prayer. It's a mystery. God invites us, the triune God invites us into the conversation that's going on within the Trinity. And if we realize this secret, soon our prayer life will be drawn into the conversation within the Trinity. And that's a wonderful experience. Wonderful experience. That's God's invitation to us. When we pray, we don't pray. Alone, uh, we pray uh, in situ or we pray inside the life of the Father God. And that's what makes a whole lot of difference in our experience of prayer life. Not just praying for ourselves, but also praying for others. So I pray that somehow our spiritual ears will be opened up so that we can hear the mystery of God speaking to God about us. Let us pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that what we have looked at is a mystery. How can the Holy God, Triune God, be so concerned for us that even in the conversation within the Trinity, Conversations are about us. Lord, we are baffled and we marvel. We are filled with awe that you love us so much. That even within the triune God, you speak about us. God speaking to God about us. And Lord, how ungrateful sometimes we are when we stop praying for even for ourselves, not recognizing that God is praying to God about us, about me. And so Lord, we pray that you will teach us to pray. Teach us to understand what is going on within the Trinity in terms of prayer. And teach us to be drawn into that prayer in the way we pray for ourselves in the way we pray for others. Help us, dear Lord. Make the church be a place where the prayers of Jesus and the prayers of the Spirit are echoed and reproduced in the hearts of every believer. All those who love you, who have been chosen according to your purpose. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.